Looks like we are live. I'll give it a little bit. Hope everyone's having a good Thursday. Lisa's tuning that guitar. Kids just went down. Well, maybe hadn't went down. I don't know if the other kids are gonna be gonna be there, but um, but yeah, tonight we're gonna be in Psalm 51. If you can see that poster, if you have a Bible, worth grabbing that uh, for. For the normal schedule, normal announcements and everything, Sunday, 10 o'clock with Michaela for worship, uh, 10.30, uh, John uh, preaching from John's Gospel, happy Thursday, Lydia, good to see you, Mark, good to see you, Kelly, good to see all the peoples starting to show up, uh, huge congratulations to Will and Amelia on that sweet, on that sweet, sweet baby, sweet, sweet baby. I want to see the hearts. I want to see the hearts flow, float up to the heavens for Catherine. Uh, yeah, what a beautiful little girl. So happy for you guys. So happy for you, Amelia and uh, and Will, and just celebrating with you guys. Praying for praying for all the good things. Praying for you guys to just have a good week. All the help you need. All the blessings. All the Starbucks. All the all the things. Um, and our prayers are all with you. Every baby is very different. And we're praying that <laughs> your little daughter is a good sleeper and a little sweetie pie. I know she's a sweetie pie, but I have a daughter who's a sweetie pie no. and, and can be a, cha a challenging no. uh, sleeper. Say Just that. a challenging um, sleeper. Um, by the way, if you wonder why uh, pastor's kids, you know, the struggle's real. It's because of things like this. Me just talking randomly about my poor daughter. Okay. Uh, Talia, good to see you. That's right, big ups for Catherine. Uh, Psalm 51 tonight, what we'll do uh, is we'll do, I'll say a prayer. We'll sing the docs, and then uh, Lisa will take us into worship. Uh, so, <laughs> yep. Uh, okay, so let's, let's say, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> let's say a prayer. Uh, dear Jesus, thank you so much for our wonderful church. We thank you so much that you have continued to hold your body together, that you have continued to create and and even grow your 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 church, Lord. Uh, we just praise you, Lord, for the, the birth of Catherine. We just celebrate with our dear friends, Lord. We love them so much. Their hearts are so, they were so big before, we can't even imagine how, how much love has just expanded to fill all the things to cover this little little girl. We lift this little girl up to you. We just ask that she would just have this most beautiful, powerful life, uh, knowing you, following you, being a great blessing to her parents. I know that they will be a great blessing to her. And she's already such a blessing to our little church. And we just thank you so much for all the babies, all the life, all the Salazar, May, and now the Hat babies, all the Daniel babies, all the babies in all the world, Lord Jesus. We ask that you would be with us tonight and that you would watch over the service, that you would bless our time together, connect us in your spirit, connect us in the truth, help us to really grow in our love for one another and our love for you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's sing a little uh, doxology. If you got the pipes, <clears throat> it doesn't matter if you have the pipes, just uh, if you have just a second of your time, uh, wherever you are, uh, let's sing the doxology. Uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Let us worship the Lord. Right. Hi guys, good evening. Hope you are all well. Miss you. But it's good to see you here. <laughs> Alright. Um, first song is Create in Me a Clean Heart. Yeah. 
thanks for worshiping us tonight. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Psalm 51 is where we're going to be. And let's read that. Yeah, there's a whole, <laughs> there's a whole world going on. Okay, sorry, Psalm 51. Uh, let me focus. For the choir director, a psalm of David, regarding the time Nathan the prophet came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say. And your judgments against me, or your judgment against me, is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels. And they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. My friends, this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me just say one more prayer over the word. Lord Jesus, we ask that in the hearing of the scripture, in the hearing of the sermon or the teaching, that our hearts would be open to you, that any obstacle of distraction or bitterness or frustration or boredom or whatever the case may be, or just a very long, very hard day, would not keep us from hearing what the Spirit says to our spirit. I ask that you would speak in a way that is clear, that you would help me to teach in a way that is accurate, and ultimately to your glory and to our great good. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, when I was five years old, we lived in Oregon, and I remember it as the first time that I got lost in a store. We were in a grocery store called Fred Meyers. Some of you might know Fred Meyers. And I don't know exactly how I got lost, but I, I have a vague memory that I went back to a section where my mom had not been willing to buy what I wanted, which I think was red vines. I've always been a big fan of the red vines, even from a young age. I had a refined palate. Um, I don't trust people who like Twizzlers for whatever it's worth. Um, that's just insane. 
Um, but red vines, there's always been something about the red vine. But I remember like going back to an aisle to get the red vines, even though I knew I had been told we're not getting the red vines. And I said, no, I need the red vines. And so it was probably like you're turning the corner on the next aisle. And I probably just thought, oh, I'm just going to duck around the corner, snag me some vines and head back. And I don't know how long I was actually lost for because I was probably looking at the candy for a little while. But all of a sudden, I started to realize and have this dawning feeling that you probably had when you were a kid at certain moments. And I looked down the aisle, no mom. And I started to, to, to go down the aisles, you know, no mom. And, and the aisles like just stretched and stretched and stretched. And every face is like really disturbing, right? Every face was like unfamiliar. And, and this growing sort of panic started to sort of happen in my little heart. And uh, it reminds me of this William Maxwell line. He's a novelist. He wrote So Long, See You Tomorrow. And he says that a, a, a child lost utters a cry that goes on into eternity. And, uh, and I think that's, that's what it feels like when you really genuinely feel like you've lost your, 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 your mom. <laughs> You're lost in a store. Now, I did the thing that I knew when I, I, I thought a little bit about it. I knew that I was supposed to do a thing because I was in a store. And that was go to the cashier and tell them you're lost. And I went to the cashier and this super sweet lady like took my hand and she said, don't worry. And, and she got on one of those old school sort of, you know, radio things. And like to this day, I'm like, God invented those like intercom systems in Target and, and the grocery store for kids who get lost. Um, because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, my mother's name was being announced across the Fred Myers. And I don't think it was that much longer than she finally sort of rushed up to retrieve me. And, and I just remember being like, oh man, that's so good that there was, there was this nice lady to hold my hand. And it's so good that there was this intercom system. And, you know, if I think about it now, like, that's just, that's a crazy thing that like you're in a situation, but there was a place to go and there was a way for everyone to be aware of it and to help you sort of find, find your mom. Um, I am pretty convinced that adults get lost more often than children. I'm pretty convinced that the older we get, the more lost we can get. And, and yet, the older we get, I think it can be harder to know where to go or how to get back. And in the passage we have tonight, this scripture, Psalm 51, which I'm going to look at over the next couple of weeks. Psalm 51, at a very personal level, and that's the only way I... I know how to think about Psalm 51, honestly. But Psalm 51, I can remember a couple key moments in my life in which Psalm 51 was, was light in the dark, was, found me as not a child, but found me, Dante, lost in a, in a dark wood somewhere. And Psalm 51 is very personal, and, but Psalm 51 was like the Lord giving me a place to go, language to have, and almost like a series of lampposts to sort of, sort of find my way back to the Lord. And, and so that's what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at how, how does someone who is lost, how does someone who's out there in the dark, how do they find their way back? How do you, how do you come back to the Lord? How does a Christian who gets lost, who, who falls into a, a pattern of life or falls into rebellion or jumps into rebellion how do we once we have found ourselves again I think of myself as five and like I don't know how many minutes I was lost for before I realized I was lost so a lot of that is just recognizing suddenly that that's the case but what do we do when we get lost how do we get our how do we get back home how do we find our way back so the way I'm gonna look at the first part of Psalm 51 is just as five lamp posts that the Lord gives us in this psalm that kind of light the way step by step how to get back, how to get home. Um, and so first, you know, we got to set up the psalm in some ways, but it's one of the most specifically contextualized psalms in the whole scripture, right? In all the, the book of Psalms. It says, for the choir director, a psalm of David, shepherd turned king, you know David probably, regarding the time, this particular moment, that Nathan the prophet 
came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. The story is that, and this is in this is this is something that that maybe you grew up knowing about the the great sort of terrible sin of of David. Um, but it's told in the book of First uh, Samuel and chapter twelve and eleven and twelve. But the story kind of unfolds in a pretty unique way. David has gone from being the shepherd boy that was anointed by God to be the future king of Israel. And then he's gone for that 10 years of sort of running from Saul and hiding in caves and living in the wilderness and just trying to survive for 10 years before he's actually made the king of Israel. And if you know David's story, David's a famous warrior, the greatest warrior in Israel really, has a reputation, you know, just the the warrior's warrior would lead his men into battle and and was just always there on the front line of whatever conflict they were engaged in and and when we get to the story in which david commits this insanely uh sort of world shattering sin of adultery when we get to that moment it's introduced this way in the passage it says in the spring of the year when kings normally go out to war David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. And then from there, it goes into late one afternoon, after his midday rest or nap, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace and it goes from there. He, he sees Bathsheba. She's married to Uriah the Hittite, which actually is one of David's noblemen. It's one of his 30 or sort of greatest warriors. I mean, it's not some nobody that he wouldn't have been aware of. So the, the sin is, is, is egregious in the extreme. And he, he summons her. You talk about a power dynamic. You talk about, you talk about all sorts of things. And you could use different language probably for this. Um, he sleeps with her and then she gets pregnant and he realizes he's going to be found out, summons Uriah back, tries to get, encourage his men, encourage Uriah to go home, sleep with your wife so that he'll think it's his kid. I mean, elaborate set of lies and deceptions and tricks to try to cover his sin. The sin just falls like dominoes. Uriah is so noble. He's like, how could I enjoy the comforts of home when my fellow soldiers are out there sleeping on the ground? You know, he's just so loyal. And, and it's just, it just puts David to utter shame how loyal Uriah is to David when David betrayed Uriah and betrayed Bathsheba by committing adultery with her. And so you have this catastrophic series of events that culminates in him setting up or having his, his general set up Uriah to be slaughtered on the battlefield to cover his sin. Time goes by. Bathsheba mourns. David welcomes her into the palace and takes her as his wife. Then, at a certain moment, the Lord sends Nathan the prophet the first lamppost, if you have found yourself lost from the Lord, if you have found yourself having fallen into sin, having gone away from what the Lord called you to do, to be, to live, to obey, the first lamppost is this. The Lord has to confront you. Now, the, the confrontation here is very clear. The Lord sends a prophet named Nathan to go to David, to go to that moment where he is kind of in his palace and thinking that he's covered everything, that this is just going to be a secret thing that he dies with and that Bathsheba will die with as well. And Nathan confronts him, tells him a story, kind of throws him off a little misdirection, tells him a story about a, a man who who uh, always loved this little ewe lamb of his and treated it like, his, like it was his daughter or his pet, you know, his, his dearest like sort of friend. And he raised this little lamb and took care of this little lamb. And then one day, this man who was poor with this little lamb, his neighbor, a rich man who had everything, came and took that particular ewe lamb and slaughtered it to, to throw a party. 
completely unnecessary, just sort of taking that lamb and violating this man's sort of love and his poverty and all sorts of things in order to just sort of fatten himself with another feast. And then David reacts to that story and says, this person basically, this is outrageous. This person should be, should be dealt with justly, right? Should be taken, uh, you know, in prison or should be slaughtered, whatever. And then Nathan turns to him and says, you're the person who did that. You're the person who did this. You're the person who took the ewe lamb and slaughtered her. I mean, there's no uncertain terms. It's completely ruined this family ruined their lives and destroyed coercively destroyed her and then slaughtered her husband to cover his sin the lord the first lamppost and this is oftentimes what we're trying to run from a lot of times when you sin or you develop a pattern of sin in a particular area of your life you go further and further into the dark because you don't want the lord to confront you the only way back The only way back, church, is if the Lord can confront you and you can hear him confront you. That's the only way to see that first lamppost light up in the dark. You will be lost into eternity if you don't see that lamppost light up. The Lord has to confront you. Now, the Lord can confront you in a variety of ways, but what you have to make sure of is that you're not trying to avoid the Lord confronting you. Because the implication is that you know the Lord, you're aware of the Lord, and the Lord has a call on your life, has some kind of connection with you, and you're running like David ran from the Lord's presence. So you're going further and further out there, further and further into the dark. So the Lord confronts David by sending a prophet. Now, I can tell you there have been a few sermons in my life at key moments in my life where the Lord basically through the prophet, the person preaching, confronted me in a way that was not even a little vague. I'm hearing a sermon. I'm dealing with something that I don't want to deal with. And I'm not dealing with it by turning back, repenting, by, by trying to find my way back to the Lord. I'm dealing with it by like pretending it's not that big of a deal, hiding from whatever it might be. And through a sermon, I can think of a few in particular key moments in my life with the Lord. Through a sermon, through the mouth of a prophet, let's say, uh, the Lord confronts me, directly, directly confronts me. I'm sitting there in a church, I'm sitting there in a congregation, people are hearing whatever. They might be bored, they might be thinking all sorts of things, they might be thinking about their lunch, and I am hearing the voice of God confronting me, and it is like, there is no escape. Now, people next to me probably don't notice. I'm not, I don't start screaming, right? <laughs> but I know in my spirit that the Lord is confronting me in that moment. The Lord has to confront you. Sometimes the Lord will confront you by the natural effects of your sin, which is kind of what each of these sort of warnings were for David, that the Lord would confront him with like, whoa, 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 look at the results. Whoa, what are you doing? Look what's happening to your life. The further you go away from the Lord, the natural consequences of those sins are moments of the Lord being like, look at the fruit of what you are doing. Look at what this is doing to other people. Look at what is happening to your family. Look at what is happening to your marriage. Look at what is happening to your children. Look at what is, look what's happening to your finances. Look what's happening to your soul. The Lord is confronting you by the natural effects of your own sin. And yet all the time when that kind of happens in people's lives, they tend to want to keep running. Pretend it's not happening. Pretend it's not the result of sin. Pretend it's not this. Pretend it's not that. Not deal with the consequences. But the Lord absolutely Absolutely. In our experience, the Lord can simply confront you with the fruit of your own sinful actions, right? This is what your life has turned into. These are the things and the damages that are the natural consequence of your rebellion against the Lord. He can confront you by you just sort of looking at that. I mean, I know people who called me up and been like, I'm thousands of dollars in debt because I have a gambling addiction. Nobody knew this person had a gambling addiction. All of a sudden, they're in such despair because they literally have less than zero and they don't know what they're going to do, how they're going to make rent, what they're going to do to, to, to even admit this to anybody. They're feeling ashamed, embarrassed, all sorts of things. They just want to run and hide. But that phone call is, is a moment of the Lord being like, like, this is it. Like, first lamppost. The Lord has to confront you over your sin. The first lamppost that you meet is that moment when the Lord takes something that you were trying to push away, trying to say it's not that, not that big of a deal, it's not, it's not the result of that, or, or trying to explain away, ah, it's not my fault, you know, it's, not, it's other people's fault, whatever it is. 
And that first lamppost is the Lord confronts you. Nathan says to David, you are this person. You are the person that has run away from the Lord. You are the person who has broken this family, destroyed this life. You are this person who has committed this, this heinous act and has, and has suffered the consequences or is going to suffer these consequences. That wake-up call is the first lamppost. That wake-up call is not something, wherever you're at right now, that, 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 that wake-up call from the Lord, when he confronts you, maybe he confronts you just uh, something that you would think is kind of small. Maybe you're just gossiping right now. Like maybe you're just talking about someone behind their back and you're not celebrating them. <laughs> you're not like, oh, I just love Bob. Bob, oh, Bob is so wise and Bob is so kind. You're just like, oh, Bob, you know? And maybe you just have a habit or a pattern with certain people or relationships you have where it's just really easy to cut them down. Just really easy to gossip about them. Scripture is very clear. Gossip is not a part of God's kingdom. It's not even, it's not welcome. <laughs> it's not welcome in the kingdom of God. It's not the behavior that someone who's following Christ engages in. But a lot of times we're like, ah, gossip, it's not adultery, it's not murder, right? A lot of times we have sins in our lives that we're like, it's a manageable one. It's, it's a low level sin. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to hear the Lord confront me about that. There's much worse things in the world, right? If you don't have the Lord confront you, if you don't allow the Lord to confront you, if you don't recognize it. Like when Nathan says, David, you're the person. You're the person who's doing this. You're the person who's, who's broken the covenant of the Lord. David has a choice there. He's being confronted. He has a choice. Is he going to run? Is he going to lie? Is he going to push the, the darkness? Is he push himself even further into the darkness? Is he going to argue with the prophet of God? Is he going to do all that? Or is he going to see it as a lamppost? And is he going to turn at that moment and stop and say, wait, you're right. Now, the reason Psalm 51 exists is because when that first lamppost finally lights up and he recognizes inescapably the Lord has confronted him over this sin, he doesn't lie anymore. He doesn't hide anymore. He turns and he confesses. He admits it. You cannot find your way home. You cannot get back to your place with the Lord. You cannot begin to restore your place with the Lord and his work in your life until you are able to stop, recognize that the Lord has confronted you, and admit that he was right to do that. So that second lamppost now, if we move from the first lamppost and you wander a little bit, but you're like, I'm not going to keep running from this thing. I'm not going to keep putting it off. I'm not going to keep like ignoring that I'm engaging in this activity or in this mentality that is clearly not what the Lord has required of me. Then that second lamppost that you get to is that you must speak directly with the Lord. Like David has to have Psalm 51, not just a conversation with Nathan. So like in my example, uh, I can remember when I felt confronted by the Lord in a sermon. Um, it's not over because I was confronted by the Lord and I felt like, oh yeah, you're right, you're right. You know, I have to actually now engage with the Lord. I actually actually talk to the Lord. Psalm 51 is David's response to the first lamppost. It's the response to being called out by the Lord. Psalm 51 is David turning and then he says, against you and you only, right? He's going to focus on the Lord, on his sin being something that ultimately at the end of the day has broken with God. He's not going to excuse it. He's not going to say, everyone does this. He's not going to say, well, look, you know, I've been in this loveless marriage. He's not going to say, well, look, you know, like, you know, who among us hasn't struggled? You know, he's not going to do it by kind of trying to kind of worm out of it by trying to explain it. But he's also not going to do it by seeking sort of social penance right away. And we live in an age in which like, you know, and this is kind of a joke, but like celebrities, influencers, people, you know, comedians, whoever it is, um, if and when they do something wrong or they get in trouble or they get found out for having done something wrong or whatever, like there is like a way of like socially like making repentance, right? Like there's this way of socially doing that. You have a pretty kind of generic standard apology. It's usually written by like your PR person or whatever. Then you go away to, you know, a pretty nice sort of rehab area for a certain amount of time that seems like reasonable. You usually hear the same phrases. By the way, I'm not saying this stuff is wrong. I'm just saying this is not the same thing. Uh, you usually hear the same phrases. Now, I need to work on myself. I, like I, I just, you know what? I just, I've got way far away from who I really am and now I need to work on myself. 
And so you get the language like this in our culture. There's a, in a, there's a cultural way to repent that is acceptable, sort of acceptable. Uh, if everyone you know, sticks to a certain script, the Lord requiring repentance is different. You're not confessing on your platform to the world, right? You're not, you're, not, you're not looking for forgiveness from the world. You're turning directly to the Lord against you and you only. The second lamppost, you can't miss this. The second lamppost is you have to speak directly to the Lord about your sin. You have to repent directly to the Lord. And you can't, you can't go some other path. You can't get some buddies together and say, hey, you know, this is this thing I was struggling with. And, and then have them be like, oh, man, everybody struggles. And, you know, you're not that bad, man. I've been around worse things, you know. <laughs> like, you can't get true repentance from people. You can't make a true confession with people only. You have to make it directly to the Lord. The second lamppost, if you're trying to get your way back to the Lord's presence through the dark, the second lamppost is that you have to speak directly to the Lord. It's not a social performance. It's not, it's not you know, so you can restore your ability for people to like you. It's not so you can get your job back. It's not, you know, it's not whatever the motive there is that you are directly face up with the Lord and going to give an account to the Lord, not because you want to just sort of get back in people's favor. And this is usually where in our culture, repentance breaks down immediately. We find a way and like a favorable audience or a favorable couple people to sort of repent, sort of confess something. And then we get sort of just mollified or excused like they, they absolve us. And yet the Lord has not actually been addressed directly. The deep work of the heart of true repentance has not happened. That second lamppost, you have to speak directly. You have to stand before God on this, this issue and you have to confess that sin. And you have to do that no matter what happens next. No matter what happens next, no matter what the result is, no matter what anybody says, no matter what, like maybe after this, people just think you're awful, can't be trusted, whatever. You don't get to control the narrative in that way. Your major responsibility in that second lamppost is that you have to deal directly with the Lord. Now, if you're going from that second moment to that third moment, the third lamppost to make a true path back through the dark, if you've gotten lost in sin, the third lamppost back is you have to tell the truth and you have to break with the sin. So this is something that is incredibly important, but there has to be a decisive break with the sin. This is why I think repentance can break down again. A lot of times when we, when we feel confronted or we feel bad or whatever it might be, we, we, we just feel bad and we don't want to feel bad. And so we're willing to, you know, just, I don't want to feel bad. Like, like I want this to stop feeling bad. And so we'll oftentimes try to deal or manage with uh, manage things in a way that tries to keep me from feeling bad. But that third lamppost is that you have to tell the truth and you have to break with the sin. You have to make a clean break with the sin. So you have to literally turn from that behavior. You have to stop uh, gambling away your money or your spouse's money or whatever it is. You have to stop gossiping. You have to break with that sin you have to stop this activity. You have to stop this sin. You have to call it what it is. David says very clearly, I have done what is evil in your sight. That's how you tell the truth about sin. Now, again, that language is not popular in our time. It's more like I'm broken and I lost my way, you know, from my true self or whatever it might be. But that's not Christian repentance. That's not you before the Lord. That's just, that's a different thing. That's a different kind of social performative thing. This is something much, much deeper where you have to be able to say that what this was was evil. That, you know, engaging in this activity or, or, or harboring this in your heart over time or whatever has, is something that is directly against the Lord. That's in rebellion to God, that it's evil. You have to be able to say that or you won't be able to make a decisive break with it. If you, if you redirect the focus to say, well, this is why, or look, I have all these reasons, or look, I've been hurt too, and you try to kind of work your way through it without just owning it and admitting it and confessing it for what it is, 
then you're not going to be able to continue to find your way back. You're going to get lost again. That's the whole point, right? So you have to make a decisive break with the activity. Again, this might seem obvious to you, but I've talked to people who struggle with like, I don't know, like a relationship at, with a coworker that they didn't think quite, you know, crossed the line, but was getting close and with something like this. And like the clearest, you know, advice to somebody was like, uh, well, you have to, you have to confess this and you have to break with the activity, right? You made a vow forsaking all others. As long as you both shall live, you have to turn, you have to leave that activity, that direction, that momentum, whatever it is. You have to make a decisive break then with that friendship or whatever that is. You have to make a decisive break. You can't, if you're, if you're struggling with alcohol and the stuff that's going on because of that, you have to make a decisive break and you don't go there anymore to drink with your buddies. Like you just have to, you have to make a decisive break or you'll continually find ways to excuse it. Look, it's been a hard day. Look, man, I'm just down on my luck. Look, this is what's going on. Look, that's what's going on. Look, I've been mistreated. Look, you'll always find a way to slide back into the dark if you don't make a clean break and call it what it is. I've done, he says, what is evil in your sight. It takes courage. It takes clarity. It takes the truth. It takes the spirit. It takes the Lord to be able to reveal that. And, and it takes a, takes a woman, it takes a man to be able to stand up and say, this is what it is. I have been living in a way that dishonors the Lord and it's, he's made it clear in his word and he's called me out on it and I'm not going to run anymore. I mean, that's, that's the way back. So that's that third lamppost that you have to tell the truth and actually break with the pattern of behavior. The fourth lamppost, and again, these things are, you know, if you want to get back to your place with the Lord, if you want to come back out of that place where you've lost your way, where you've just drifted into activities, lifestyles, patterns of living or thinking that are clearly against the Lord and are just burying you. The way back is with these moments that David's lighting the way here with Psalm 51 and this act of repentance. The fourth lamppost is that you have to know or you have to at least sense the scope or the weight of sin's true effect. You have to know or sense the scope or the weight of sin's true effect. David says, my sin is ever before me. He talks about his sin as being a stain, sort of like Lady Macbeth, right? Like trying to, she's like she's committed murder, right? Like it can't get the blood off her hands, right? So it's like the, the stain is beyond the moment. It's like the, the, the action's over, but I can't get this guilt out of my soul. It's like it's stained. It's, he calls it, I am haunted by this day and night. It's, it's always with me. Like it's always there in the shadowy corner of my heart. I can't get away from it, right? And what, what in part he's doing and confessing that and talking about that is he's saying the sin itself is not just the moment or the event or the action, but the sin is like a, a toxin. A, it's like a poison that spreads everywhere. And that, that the sins that we live in, that we, co that we commit, and that we run away from the Lord in order to continue to indulge in, or we, get, or we lose our way by just falling one into another into another without turning back, those sins have dramatic effects that are hard to even, and, and probably can't be quantified, right? Like sin changes who you are. It changes who you are. And that, that means every single one of your relationships is going to be changed because of the sin you're engaged in. Right? Like that, everything, but it's hard to say, point at where that's coming from, how that works. It's just, it's David talking about there's a stain here. There's something deeper here that's like a haunting. Like I can't get away from this. It, it's like, it's like, you know, maybe you sinned, you know, and struggled in different like ways in the past in certain relationships. And then you just end up trying to start over, new relationship, new me, new job, new me, new whatever, new me. And yet it's you, it's the same you with that stain. It's that same kind of haunted part of you that is being brought into the next relationship. It's being brought into the next home, into the next workplace, into the next whatever. That you can't actually get rid of it by just like, okay, that moment's over. I'm just going to start fresh, right? That sin does something different. Sin is not like a, a, an accident or a mistake where you didn't understand something or you didn't mean to do something. Sin is a direct course of action that is against the Lord and that is pursued with agency. So when it's done or when you have a pattern or a life of that, it's not that you're always committing that same sin. It's that maybe you gossiped, you know, a couple days ago about whoever. Well, now every time you see whoever, 
You, you look at them just slightly differently. You might not even believe that or know that, but it's affecting how you see that person and the person you gossiped with. Now, when you see them, and especially if you see them in the company of that other person, there's another look. There's another thing. These subtle changes that sin kind of produces over your expressions, over your moods, over your interactions, whether it's just like your interaction with a neighbor. If you've been coming out of a place of sin and you go out to interact with your neighbor, you're, you're not in a good place to be like, hey, neighbor, do you need to borrow some sugar? <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not in like some free space. You're actually already sort of, there's like a toxic thing going on and it's gonna haunt you even in environments or with people that you're not actively sinning with or around. It totally affects absolutely everything. And, and that's like a grown up way of, of viewing sin. It's not just like, oh, I lied. And you stop lying, you know, that, that one lie was a, that was a bad thing to do. Next time I won't lie. It's like, oh man, when I, like, why did I lie? <laughs> why am I trying to pretend some, to be someone I'm not? Why, why, am I, why am I hiding, you know, from consequences? Why, why, why am I doing this? It's so much deeper. And David, fourth lamppost, David knows that it's so much deeper. Um, you know, I think of, and, and again, I'm, I, I'll apologize to my kids forever, I'm sure. But like um, when, like if my daughter does something um, that she knows is wrong, like if she hits uh, John or something, um, and I go, you know, I go, Violet, what are you, what are you doing? She'll just start crying. Like she'll she'll just start screaming, crying sometimes, and and I'll be like, wait, no, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. And and at first it was like, oh man, she's like feels real, like she. She feels really sad, you know, like she's just really repentant, you know, she's really reacting to that. And what we realize is it's like, it's a, it's her obvious, it's like a technique, right? Instead of dealing with like admitting that she did something wrong, cause she'll just say she didn't do it or something. Um, she just covers that by just crying. Just like, I'm just going to cry and distract and like throw up a block, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm not going to admit to this thing. I'm not going to kind of whatever. And I, you know, it's a remarkable reaction. And, and I only mention it because I'm pretty sure I do the same thing with the Lord. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure the Lord's like trying to call me out on something. And like my first reaction is like, <laughs> it's just like, it's like, mmm, I'm having a bad day, you know, just like screaming about something else. And the Lord's like, what are you, what are you talking about? What, what are you talking about? Why, why are you mentioning every other thing that I wasn't talking about? I think that's our reaction a lot of times is like we don't want to just admit like what sin actually is. And so we can't continue to move forward if we're not able to sort of acknowledge the scope and the weight of what, what we did or, or what it is. And David is willing to do that. That's why he's able to repent. You can't find your way back through the dark with the Lord into his presence where he can start sort of reforming, restoring, reshaping you again, unless you're able to sort of admit the, the weight of sin's actual effects in your life and the lives of others. I, I wish, I, I don't know if I wish, but I wish that our sins were self-contained, but they, they aren't self-contained. They spill out and they affect everybody that we ever interact with in an extraordinary way. And, and, and so dealing with that and bearing the, the responsibility of that is an enormous part of true repentance. And I'm telling you, it might, this might seem like, oh, that's heavy. I don't want to do it. I don't even want to think about that. It's the only way you can be free. It's the only way you can be free. This is the only way that you can actually, you know, restart something with the Lord and, and get back to that place that you want to be with the Lord is if you're able to just acknowledge it's not like it was just this momentary thing. It has a weight to it. There's a gravity to it, and it affects more than we realize. So in that sense, then, and when you're able to know the fourth lamppost, when you're able to sort of know the scope of sin's true effect, then, it, then, then repentance does not even feel like a quick fix. I think one of the traps for Christians is that repentance feels really cheap. It feels like, man, I know better. I actively chose to do that and engage in whatever, maybe repeatedly, maybe for years. Uh, and yeah, I feel bad. Maybe I got caught, you know, maybe I got confronted or whatever. And, uh, you know, when someone's caught, like, like people will do anything to get their life back, right? Like <laughs> if they feel like they're going to lose their life or something, or lose something they, they take for granted, you know, they'll, they'll say anything, do anything to make it go away, to, to make normal world come back, right? So, so there might be that moment, I think, in Christians' lives when, 
like you feel bad, you can't whatever, but then when you like apologize or you repent, you try to ask for the Lord's forgiveness, things like that. I think if you've like repented for the same thing several times, I think in your heart you feel like this is cheating. This is cheap. Like I knew what I was doing. I knew I shouldn't be doing that. I did it again. And now I'm just like, oh, can you forgive me again? <laughs> Is it, is, are we cool? Like, even if we wish, like, there was a quick fix, I think the heart knows. I think the heart tells against us. Because I feel like in my life as a Christian, like, there's moments where I'm, like, confessing or apologizing or repenting to the Lord. And part of me feels like this doesn't feel, and like, this doesn't feel, this feels easy. This feels too cheap. This feels like, I, like I'm just, like, you know, trying to get out of jail, you know, like, with that, that jail free card or whatever. Like, this doesn't feel, it feels like a quick fix. It doesn't feel like a real thing, right? I think sometimes because Christians maybe don't go, like, deep into that place of repentance, it can feel like repentance is kind of like a, it's kind of a scam, and it's kind of like a thing. It almost feels like fake or like we're pretending to feel bad enough to not so feel so bad again. And I think part of that, that fourth lamppost is the Lord saying, this is not a quick fix. Sin is sin is taking the response like true repentance is taking the responsibility for what sin actually is and what it has done. And and if you really like owned that, if you owned the damaging effects of gossip uh, on on relationships, if you if you owned uh the damaging effects of hostility or hatred in your heart towards somebody, um, you know, if you owned, I don't know, theft or or whatever, you know, that you may have struggled with when I was a when I was a kid, when I was young-ish, yeah, a teenager or whatever, like, I, I was like a kleptomaniac. Like, I regularly stole things. And it was always like, ah, you know, <laughs> this company has plenty of these things, you know? Like, it was never, like, dealing with the reality of it. It was never dealing with the reality of, like, oh, I have become a thief. Oh, I have become a liar. Like, this is not just something I engage in periodically or whatever when I'm bored or something. This has now changed who I am. It's changed my character. It's made me lie to my parents on multiple occasions so that I don't ever get caught or have to deal with anything, right? Like, it, to actually finally get to a moment when I repented of of being a thief, there's really no way to put it. Even though thieves, sounds like an old school, sounds like essential oil. It sounds like an old school thing where, you know, you're like, you got like mitts with finger holes or whatever. And you're like, you know, you're just in the shadows or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, but if you ever used to be a thief, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Like, it's a rush. It's just like doing a drug or anything else. Um, but I remember finally repenting of being a thief at a certain point. I think I was like, let's call it 17. Um, and I remember, like, I remember feeling the Lord tell me, like, slow down. Slow down and, like, like take an account of this. Because I would feel guilty. I was a Christian. I go to church every Sunday of my whole life, right? And I still steal all the time. So I like, I feel bad and I'm sure I feel convicted in a sermon and then I would let it go at that. Like I felt bad, like I'm, I'm gonna be okay now. Um, I remember when the Lord finally got me to deal with this and said, you're, you're straight lost. Like you're lost. This isn't a joke anymore, you're lost. Um, and I remember the Lord being like, you have to deal with this. And, and starting to just recount how many times I had rebelled against the Lord and committed that particular sin. How many times I had lied to cover it to, to literally anybody around me, anywhere, you know? How willing I became as a human being to lie, to uh, get out of anything. How that had totally changed my language. How my language always became in the service of uh, serving myself, of getting me what I wanted when I wanted it. How I had like become like a professional liar, like just impulsive, professionally, easily, just, just when I started, to, this is crazy. I was like 17, 18. And when I started to actually think of all of the places that this sin had poisoned my life, my witness, what witness? Um, like it became like any witness I had was like totally fake and hypocritical. Like I was, a, I was exactly the opposite of what I told people <laughs> I was. Um, like it was, it was, it was, I just remember feeling, I remember where I was. I was <laughs> 
I was in, a, what is it, Rite Aid in San Clemente. And I remember being in this Rite Aid in San Clemente. And, and I, the Lord finally called me on it. It was like I was impulsively about to steal something. I had no, I had no reason to steal. I had, I had money to buy it. It was not even a thing. But I had become like, you know, an addict or, or whatever. It become like an, an impulsive or compulsive behavior. And, uh, well, I don't even want to say that. Because actually it was totally, my will was active and alive. And I had perfect ability not to do that. Um, nonetheless, the fact that I was so used to habitually committing that particular sin was an extraordinary moment in the middle of that store when the Lord, like, it was, it was like just a series of images, a series of lies that I would have spoken to my mom, who was like the sweetest lady in the world, who couldn't even fathom, you know, how, how many times I hadn't told her the truth. She always thought the best, always assumed the best of me, always just, you know, loved me unconditionally. And just, just, just all that, I just remember just like cascading down, like, what my sin actually had become it like become who I was it totally poisoned everything and and it wasn't enough to say well nobody knows or no or they didn't really know you know uh, because between the Lord and I because I was talking directly to the Lord and I wasn't like trying to get out of it by talking to somebody else um, I just felt the weight of it for just a moment and I'm telling you this is a years-long pattern of behavior um, first thing I stole which was a lot was when I was four so I mean like I <laughs> stole like fifty dollars with it football cards from Sam's Club, Price Club, Price Club, uh, Costco, uh, to you uh, folks these days. Um, this has been such a pattern, it had been such a pattern in my life that I remember feeling just in sudden, this one rush moment, the absolute cascading wave of the toxic, just poison weight of my sin. And I don't know what the sins you struggle with. I mean, assuming if you've come to know the Lord, you've repented of some stuff. If you've been walking with the Lord, you're repenting of some stuff because, because ain't nobody out here walking with the Lord perfectly, even though I think that's actually possible. Praise God, freed from sin. Reread Romans if you're not sure about that. Romans 8 in particular, which is after Romans 7, and that's important. Um, we are freed from sin. Sin no longer has the power over our lives as Christians. So if we engage in sin as Christians, we are actively disposing our will in that direction on purpose. No confusion, no, ex no excuses, no explaining it away. And I know as a Christian, I have to repent regularly from losing my temper, or being impatient, this, that, that, whatever. Not doing something I should have done, being lazy, being, being selfish, being, you know, not taking time for this or not having the, you know, whatever. Like a life of repentance is not some woe is me life. It's just an honest life. It's just an honest life. And so, so when you're like aware of sin and you start to kind of grow up in how you deal with the Lord and you start to take more responsibility for it, it's like you're, you're, you're like almost eager, you're eager to repent when you notice something in your life and the Lord calls you on something, you're eager to repent because you're like, sin is crazy. Sin will, sin will literally ruin everything. Sin literally has ruined our planet. It's ruined our culture. It's ruined our country. It's ruined our society. It's ruined everything. It's ruined marriages. It's ruined families. It's ruined everything. Everything that has come into our world apart from hurricanes or something is sin, right? And so it, when you like start to reckon with that and you start to kind of grow up in how you deal with that reality and actually talk directly to the Lord about that, man, if you even sense that you are in sin in something. You're not some like, oh, this is why religion is bad. It makes me feel bad. You're like, how can I, how can I make sure that I'm dealing with what I need to deal with? What, 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 what David says here, he says, what the Lord wants is honesty. He just wants honesty in the inward parts, in the deepest places of our soul. He just wants honesty. Like he just wants men and women who can tell the truth about their own hearts confess it, deal with him directly, reckon with the weight of it, and not just, oh, let's move past that moment, let's pretend it didn't happen, reckon with the weight of it, and then that fifth lamppost of getting out of the dark, of, of finally flushing out a dark area of your heart, or some of you may be totally in the dark right now, and this is the Lord through Nathan or whatever, just saying, you need to come back, you need to repent and return to me, you need to come home. You are lost. A child lost utters a cry that goes into eternity. You don't need to pretend that you're not lost anymore. You don't need to pretend it's cool to be lost. You don't need to, pre you don't need to pretend anything. 
He desires truth and honesty in the inward parts. Don't be afraid to tell the truth about yourself. Don't be afraid to not make an excuse for yourself. Don't be afraid. It's the Lord you're talking to. You, you don't have to write me an email. I mean, you can if the Lord, if you want to. You don't have to. You don't have to tell me. Oh, and then and then it was this, and then it was that, and then it was all this stuff. You're talking to the Lord, and He wants truth in the inward parts. He wants truth from where you're at. He wants the truth of your marriage, how you've been treating your wife. He wants the truth of how you talk about people. He wants the truth of how you handle certain things, of how you deal with things, about the truth of trying to take the edge off again and again and again and again. He wants the truth. He just wants the truth. That's the lamppost. You, you, you have darkness and you have lamppost. You don't, you don't have something else. You have darkness and then you have these lights, these, these lanterns that just show up suddenly when you're completely out there and you shouldn't be and you need to get back home. This is the, the lady touching my, my hand and saying it's going to be okay and getting on that old school Fred Myers intercom system and saying, <laughs> you know, attention shoppers, you know, <laughs> have a little boy here who's lost may have stolen red vines, not clear, mother come quick, you know. Like, that's what the lamppost is. Don't be afraid to get saved. Don't be afraid to be forgiven. Who are you talking to? You're talking to the Lord. Fifth lamppost, last lamppost. I'm on my home stretch, here we go. Acknowledge the Lord's role and just authority. Acknowledge his role and his authority. David says, Lord, you will be proved right in what you say. Your judgment against me is just. I'm not going to make any excuses. Whatever you say, whatever you render, whatever it is, you're, you're the authority. You're the judge. You're, you're everything. There's another line in Maxwell's book, just because I'm thinking about it, is he says that my father was an authority. He was the authority in my life. And because he was the authority in my life, I assumed that meant he couldn't be understanding. Friends, that fifth lamppost, acknowledge that the Lord has authority over your life, that he is the judge and, it, he, and that his, his judgment is just. Acknowledge that. Don't, don't begrudge him that. Don't say, oh, you know, this is this sort of tug of war between you and the Lord where, where yeah, you confess, but you actually kind of feel resentful or yeah, you confess, but it makes you feel small and you don't like to feel small or humble and you don't like to feel humble or like a child and you don't like to feel like a child and you don't like sermons that even suggest that maybe you should feel humble or be <laughs> or are small or whatever. It's like just acknowledging the Lord is the just judge of your life, of all humanity. That's his role, that's his authority. But unlike Maxwell, at least in his worry that because his father was the authority, he couldn't also be understanding. My friends, fifth lamppost, your judge is Jesus Christ. Your judge, if you were with us on Sunday, is the good shepherd. Your judge is the good shepherd who went out to find you tonight and is actually guiding you home. This isn't five steps on how you can fix your life. This is five places your good shepherd by your side, having laid down his life for his sheep. These are five places that he is guiding you as he brings you back to the sheepfold, as he brings you back to the flock. Your authority, your just judge is also the Christ who has understood your sin and taken it upon himself in sacrificial love. You don't need to be afraid of this judge. Last week I said, revival comes through God's judgment. And that's because God's judgment, before that final judgment, God's judgment, which is what repentance is a moment of, God's judgment is followed by his grace. God's judgment is an example of his grace. Why would he want you to confess? Why would he want you to repent? Because he just, he just wants to spite you. He <laughs> just wants to make you feel bad. I mean, he's not, he's not a person like that. He's not petty. Why, why does he call us out? Why, why does he tell us to reckon with the weight of our sin? Why does he tell us to make a clean break from this pattern of life? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. Because he's trying to save you. Because he wants your, your marriage to have a chance and be well. He wants your life to overflow with good and perfect things. The only motivation 
for the God who has now given up his life for his flock. The only motivation for him ever calling David out is to save David because he loves David. That's what's happening when God calls you to repent. He is saying, I love you. I'm not done with you. Stop wandering out there. It would be so crazy if my mom was like, you know what? He walked away. He walked away. I told him we weren't getting red vines. He chose to go get red vines. Good luck. Got in the minivan and just drove home. That would be, we were like, oh no, right? That would be crazy. It would be so crazy to think of that situation. And yet, a lot of times when we think of the Lord, we're like, you know, he's just this abstraction. He's just this far away and I don't want to feel guilty and this makes me feel bad and stop telling me it's sin. It's just, it's just brokenness. It's just, it's just, it's just an impulse. It's not, it's not me. Christian, he's calling us back to himself. He's, he's trying to revive us. He's trying to bring revival into our homes, into our relationship with our kids. You know, the most powerful thing a parent can do is apologize to their kid when you did something wrong. Like when you did something wrong in front of them or to them, I mean, that's, that's just a whole different level. You take a knee and you kind of look your, let's just pretend this has happened. Take a knee, look your son in the eyes like, hey man, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have talked to you with that tone. Dad, Dad shouldn't have been angry like that. I love you, I, I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have made you feel, you know, like afraid or whatever it is, you know, if, I, if my, my voice is loud and sometimes I don't, I don't realize how loud it is or whatever. And, and, but there's times when I'm just like, you know what? I got to apologize to my, my child here. Um, I got to, I got to, why? Oh, like, <laughs> because I want a better relationship with my, with my kids. Because I want a better relationship. I have to be, if you can't apologize to your spouse, like, I don't know how you could be married. Like, if you can't repent and humble yourself in front of your spouse and say, I was out of line there, um, I don't, I, I'm sorry, I should have talked to you that way, or I was just being selfish, or I should have included, you, you know, whatever it is, I, I'm not here to do your counseling right now, but, but like whatever it is, like if, if you want a good marriage, that's what you do. If you want a good relationship with your kids, like you confess your sin to the Lord, you deal with your heart, you tell the truth. And, and you do that because yes, he's a just judge, yes, he has the authority, but the only reason he's even calling you to repent right now is because he loves you, because he wants to get back to work. It's because he wants to revive something that's gone cold in your heart. Maybe you grew up in church or, you know, vaguely attending church and you kind of believed, but you've just never been fully committed to him, but you kind of known, but you kind of don't know because you kind of don't want to know. He loves you too much to keep just letting you wander off into the dark. So just let that, let that sit with you. The reason that he's calling you back, the reason he's shepherding you home is because he wants you home it's because he loves you it's because you're you're his sheep and he's your good shepherd there's no sort of secret motive it's all made very plain and clear by the actions jesus actually took on our behalf this isn't lip service this isn't someone just trying to make you like them or something like this this is someone who put his life laid it down and was unjustly executed so that he could absorb the cost and the weight of all this sin so that he could actually remove all of this sin. David says, yeah, you're the just judge, you're the authority, and therein lies the power. He says, I'm going to confess, and you will be able to wash me clean. I am going to, sh to, to give you my heart, and you will be able to purify it. Thank God, God has the power to do that. It's not just to feel better. It's not a performance so you can get back to your career on social media. You know, it's not, it's not our culture's version of this. This is deep, transformative soul care, ultimately that the Lord wants to restore you and restore your relationship with him, restore your relationship with others. And that's what we're gonna talk about next week. I gotta put the bookmark right there. Repentance and restoration, Psalm 51. This is how we get home. I am convinced adults get lost more often than children, but let this be a first lamppost for some of you. Maybe a second, a third, a fourth, or a fifth for others. The Lord is leading you back. Follow him. Trust him. He loves you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for making it possible 
to not be lost anymore. Thank you so much for loving us that you would go after us in the dark and show us the way back. Thank you so much that you desire truth and that that truth will begin to set us free. I pray that anybody here in this, even if it's been easy to think of whatever as not a big deal or a small kind of sin or whatever, I pray that this would be a moment where they'd be able to be free because they could confess and repent that sin to you. And I pray that they would know that they got to speak directly to you. That if anybody here in this feels confronted about anything by you, not, not by me, but by you, by your spirit, that they would then speak directly to you, even now from their heart, and confess that. And that you would engage them in this activity of leading them back to this place where you can and will restore them. I thank you so much for Psalm 51. It has rescued me, Lord. It has rescued me. There are moments in my life where I thought I knew too much and had gone too far away to be allowed to come back. It has rescued me. I pray it will rescue someone else. Help us to remember this passage and go over it and find these words are the words of the Spirit and these words are the lamppost, are the light unto the path. Thank you so much for this psalm. And I thank you for all who are willing to repent, all of us who want to get home. And I ask that you would just bless everyone here in the scripture tonight and bless this little church in Jesus' name, amen. All right, my friends. We'll finish up Psalm 51 next week talking about God's restorative justice. Restore, restore, restore. Uh, so I hope you'll be here for that. Um, I know this is kind of whatever, but you know, Lisa and I are like all in with you guys. We're all in with, with Zoe and everything that's going on. We're trusting the Lord for everything that's going on. We're trusting the Lord that, that he's not going to give us um, something that is less than what we need. And I know this can feel a lot less than what we're used to, but by his spirit and through the power of the word and through the gathering of us together in the spirit, he's going to give us everything we need. And I just want to encourage you and remind you, he's not going to say, oh, well, then there was that year, you know, where COVID happened. And so, you know, I just, my hands were tied, you know, like he's going to give you everything you need. He's going to give our church everything we need to continue to trust in Jesus, to continue to walk forward with him, to make it through this no matter what. This is not second best, even though it feels and sometimes looks, I was just in frame. I was like, man, it looks like I'm living in an earthquake. You're on, you're on five stack of books right here and some of them aren't flat. I mean, there's all sorts of little things. So it can feel, I know it can feel like, ah, you know, this is just whatever. In the spirit, through the power of the life of the word, because Jesus loves us, there's nothing second best about what's going on in our church right now, about what he wants to do in our lives right now, in our homes, our marriages, etc. You don't need another sermon from me, but as one of your pastors, I love you with all my heart, and I trust that we are going to make it through this with Jesus, growing stronger every day. We are not waiting to grow. We are growing now by his grace. So, uh, so go all in. Just tackle whatever he calls you to tackle and trust him with everything that you got. As always, uh, I got to kick you out of my living room here. <laughs> so if you have to go, what you do, go in peace, my friends, and may God go with you.